Okay, well, it, that was a very exciting presentation, and I, I, I can guarantee this one will not be exciting. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, as the previous presentation emphasized good practice in clinical practice, uh, my presentation is more theoretically orientated. And also, as it comes at the end of a whole process, for some of you, it's like five days. This is the last presentation. It's, um, it, uh, ideas have occurred to me, over, as one would expect, over the last uh, a few days. And I would like to comment on one or two aspects of uh, the, the themes that have been emerging uh, before I go into uh, the central part of my talk, which focuses on issues of migration and global mental health. Uh, I just want to really begin by uh, showing a few slides from my, oh my God, uh, from my trip to Brazil. I've been working in Brazil now over a period of some 12 years. And one of the concerns I have when one is talking about global mental health is the setting up of dichotomies of you know, the first world, the third world, the low and middle income countries v. the high income countries, the developing world and the developed world, and so on. And I think if one looks at contemporary India and certainly Brazil, one sees a great complexities. And I teach uh, uh, American students, and I really do try and show the complexities of Brazil to them because for them, Brazil is all about gun violence, corruption, uh, street kids, and so on, and there's nothing else. But Brazil is, of course, multifaceted, and I think this is just a shopping mall near where I stay in Brasilia, you know, with these amazing facilities for kids and people to look after children. This is a bookshop um, for children. Uh, the state-of-the-art strollers for babies. The outside, there's tennis courts. There's uh, excellent facilities. And the life of middle-class Brazilians is actually comparably much more comfortable than, I'd say, middle-class Americans or, or British. And some of my Brazilian academic colleagues are openly quite amused when they get offered discounted rates to the American Anthropological Association and tell me rather discreetly that actually they earn more money than American academics, and that's true. So, you know, it's a complex situation. But one thing about Brazil is that's incredibly stark is the social inequalities. For example, this is a, a, a satellite city outside Brasilia called Estructural, which is one of the places where the city's trash is, is, is dumped, and which has a population of around 50,000 people living in kind of corrugated houses and so on. And I, I've been working there. These are just some images. The kids go to school um, only for half the day. But even in the very bad conditions they live, the, Parents generally sort them out, and they look pretty smart going off to school. But in the afternoon, after they've been to school, there's really nothing there except asbestos, burning fires, uh, crime. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly dangerous uh, place. And it's near, the, as I say, the city trash uh, 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 centre, the trash dump which says outside, no kids or adolescents. But actually, if you go into the, the dump, it's, there are many, many children working there, and, and, they've, and all kinds of things can be found there. Even babies have been found on, on the trash dump. Uh, so it's a really harrowing environment. This is the kind of apocalyptic scenes when people, when the garbage arrives and and people try to eke out a living through sifting through the, the debris. Now, within this context, and I think Jeffrey offered some kind of vision of hope, um, 
there's, there's students working there from the Department of Psychology and Anthropology at University of Brasilia doing something what they, uh, uh, they call uh, community outreach or, or extension. And they've been setting up an NGO themselves offering sports, uh, lessons, music, artwork, and so on. And I've and getting little desks so that the kids in the afternoon can spend some time uh, doing lessons or creative activities. And just after I was in, just before I was in Brasilia, uh, Michelle Obama actually visited the center and gave the NGO some money towards the music activities. But it's, uh, it's being set up right now and the idea is that the facilities are offered to improve the mental and social well-being of the children in, in the neighborhood. And I'm working on, who is that kid in the middle? I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm working on, on helping to set up an evaluation and, and research project there. I wasn't going to show these slides of Brazil, but I thought in the course of the last couple of days, I wanted to uh, pause for some reflection on this dichotomization of the first world, the third world, l l low to middle in income countries and high income countries, because, and, and focus on the complexity within uh, so-called um, low to middle income countries. I mean, Brazil, for example, now has uh, overtaken the UK in terms of GDP. So where does one uh, uh, place this dichotomy? <coughs> Anyway, to return to the present theme, um, one of my major concerns has also been around issues of, as Rachel um, was talking about exoticizing the other, I've been very interested in issues of the production of knowledge and uh, in relation to the issues of modernity and I'll just give you a little example. The very first uh, conference, anthropology conference, I spoke at was in Cambridge in 1985. It was organized by Charles Leslie and uh, included Michael Tausig, Roland Littlewood, and others. And I was giving a paper on somatization in South Asian communities. And it was a critique of the literature on somatization and contributions by uh, psychiatrists such as Philip Rack and others. And I remember I was struck after the talk, uh, an Indian psychiatrist approached me and, and said to me, why do you take these ignorant people so seriously? <laughs> so, and and I, was, I was kind of rather taken aback. And it, it generated a lot of reflection. As an anthropology student, I was uh, at Sussex University and going out into the field and uh, was advised to kind of focus on issues such as evil eye in relation to mental health or uh, uh, incidences of spirit possession and so on. And it made me reflect on the emerging epistemology of the other. Um, and Dan Sperber's uh, remarks about anthropological field notes, what one takes down, what constitutes significant knowledge. And within this context, I've been in, in the last 15 years focusing in particular on refugee populations and the construction of what I've called the epistemologies of care in relation to these uh, populations. And I talked a bit about this yesterday, and I'm going to elaborate on some of these themes today. I'm concerned with the place of mental health and mental health care within the context of the asylum and refugee processes, wherein there's evidence of a declining and shrinking parameters of legitimacy, where in many host countries there's declining rates of political asylum of people being recognized as legitimate refugees. 
And summary expulsion at borders, for example, in the Mediterranean, in the Spanish enclaves, uh, in northern Morocco, and so on. And these practices, from a theoretical perspective, can be viewed, interestingly, through the lens of the work of Walter Benjamin, for example, who invoked the idea of states of exception, which has been elaborated further by Agamben and others. But against this declining rate of legitimacy, there's a growing acceptance of uh, legitimacy through sickness or sick bodies. And this has been a theme that has been picked up by myself and also by Didier Fassan, a clinician and anthropologist, who noted in 2001 that in the previous decade in France, there was a sevenfold decrease in the acceptance of, uh, for political asylum, with a concomitant sixfold increase in acceptance on the grounds of humanitarian reasons, sickness, and particularly mental illness. So people not being allowed to uh, stay in France as legitimate political refugees, but asylum seekers instead being allowed to remain on the grounds of mental ill health. So there's an issue here of, and I have focused particularly on refugee children, occupying distinctive problem spaces located within what Fassan has called the empire of trauma, in which they inhabit discourses of risk and vulnerability. I've also been very interested in a, a dichotomy that exists within society between what may be defined as the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And this dichotomy can be traced back to medieval times, uh, where in medieval England, the parish would give paupers who were considered deserving badges they could wear so that they could show the public that they were, they were worthy recipients of alms. And those without pauper badges wouldn't be given uh, charity by people. But this dichotomy can be seen to be playing out in the present day in a moral economy of care, which juxtaposes deserving and undeserving refugees and migrants in society. So my fieldwork uh, these days has been uh, principally centered on uh, Malta, uh, Calais, uh, Zeebrugge in, in Belgium, where people, thousands of people are daily uh, arriving, many of them from the Horn of Africa. Tens of thousands have arrived in the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, uh, the, in little boats from Libya and other North African locations. The boats often sink, they're picked up by the Navy, they wind up in Malta, they don't know what Malta is. Uh, they have a, an aspiration to go to the UK often and are confused winding up in the Maltese situation. Often they travel on to Northern Europe and I've been tracing their journeys to Calais and to Dover in England. Now, I've addressed some of the complexity of this shift from legitimate asylum uh, towards what Fassan has called the sick body in relation to different views of the refugee. The view of the refugee as untrustworthy governs a strategy of what I've called non-incorporation, where, re where would-be refugees are simply not <coughs> allowed to stay. And uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and so on have documented numerous instances of people being summarily expelled. And then the context in which, and this is where the issues relating to global mental health become particularly salient, is the context in which they are allowed to stay. Um, in, in the ways in which refugees are seen as damaged and as in need of, of mental health care. And uh, I'll just skip forward. And for example, a conflation of the idea of social economic 
uh, sorry, social emotional problems with refugee children is ubiquitous in the literature. So that if one Googles refugee children, uh, one would think you'd Googled refugee children and mental health because there's something akin to 74% of the scholarly articles on refugee children focus on mental health issues. They tend to be homogenized as having analytically similar experiences and latent vulnerabilities and decontextualized within programs which constitute them commonly as a group outside of families and cultural contexts. And if one, uh, I've surveyed literature and uh, policies and programs on refugee children in the Netherlands, in Scandinavia, the UK, Australia, Canada to some extent. And often a recurring and rather surprising and alarming aspect is the, the view, a view of parents as a pathological risk factor than, rather than as a resource in therapeutic programs. So the refugee children are routinely embedded in discourses of trauma, vulnerability, social emotional problems and so on. And these underpin a large number of the totality of programs offered for refugees. One of the programs I've looked at and, and been involved actually in the exporting of over the years is the Faro Schools program, you, you'll be familiar with it, which um, I, I had some first-hand experience of in the Netherlands and subsequently worked on as part of a European Union project looking at good practice and mental health care for refugees and asylum seekers. And as part of that European project, we transferred the schools program from the Netherlands to the UK. But underpinning the programs is, uh, which included a primary school program, which uh, uh, had uh, uh, an, uh, uh, the kids involved in a, in a football team that united them and they had a song to go with the football team, We Are the World United. And, and they, they made uh, books about their experiences and so on. And in secondary school, oh, pardon me. And in secondary school, there was a distinctive refugee lesson introduced. And they did books uh, which uh, recorded their experiences. And underpinning th this was an epistemological issue of, of trying to make them whole. You know, refugee kids are often seen as broken. You know, the pre-migration uh, experience, the experience of flight and the post-migration are a dislocation which has to be repaired by, um, th through the therapeutic program. And this is uh, one of the children with, with her her book about herself. And subsequently, we introduced this program into Manchester schools, and, and they did a similar kind of so-called me book uh, about their experience. And this is kids um, as part of the World United uh, uh, class. So one of the, just to summarize some of the issues here, Along with this diminishment of political asylum, which has been recorded in many reports and, and by in the academic work of Didier Fassan, Jackie Barba's work, uh, which looked at the situation of undocumented children in Australia, the US, and, and the UK. There's this emphasis on the sick body and the sick mind, and also in grant in granting humanitarian status. So, and Hannah Arendt has commented interestingly on this in her work on the origins of totalitarianism, the, de the denial of citizenship, but being allowed a right to exist in the context of what uh, Agamben have subsequently called bare life. You know, you're allowed to exist in a country through being a human being. Uh, but not as a fully participating uh, citizen. So modes of incorporation are increasingly uh, governed by 
a moral economy of undeserving and deserving uh, refugees. And one of the interesting features of many of the discourses on refugees is an, epistemolo uh, is an epistemology of care which is linked to a soteriological aspiration. Those of you from religious studies backgrounds will know that soteriological relates to doctrines of salvation. And uh, if, if one looks at uh, through the policies relating to re Sikh refugees, one, get, one encounters quite theological type language. They were broken and we made them whole. So this kind of uniting of the past and the present and discourses of integration through a holistic uh, therapy. So I, I want to raise a, a number of questions, which is just what you want at the end of the day. You wanted a speaker who just ran things off, neatly package it and go off. Go off. But uh, instead I want to raise uh, 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 some questions I think is particularly salient to global mental health. One is, is broadly the, this dichotomy between first and third world, uh, low to middle income and, deve uh, and developing and developed world and so on. And suggest that a, an appropriate, a more appropriate paradigm is perhaps to invoke the concept Castell uses of the fourth world, which is a world that, uh, that's deterritorialized, but is present globally. You know, so for example, if one is is based in Camden, New Jersey, or uh, Philadelphia, or um, in uh, Nagoya in Japan or so on, one encounters people living in destitute and marginal situations with mental health problems. And it's not a province of one, obviously, one country or another, but is a ubiquitous global phenomenon. And also, uh, I'd like to invoke this uh, sociologist Sigmund Bauman, ideas of liquid modernity in terms of the fluidity of, um, of life in the present age and the fact that global mental health has to engage with populations that are on the move, that are not located in any particular part of the world but are increasingly moving. And this movement is not only physical movement, but also, for example, one of my PhD students studied, did a whole thesis on the use of cell phones with as among Kurdish asylum seekers in England and the role of cell phones in connecting them with their communities in Kurdistan, in making decisions, in uh, garnering support at critical times and so on. So the use of technology and social media is a, is a further aspect I think it needs to be engaged with. Within the, the context of uh, mental health, also I've evoked the idea of avenues of access and strategic categorization. This comes from my work at the Refugee Council in, in London, where for some years I evaluated a mental health team working with uh, refugees. And uh, I was aware that certain avenues of access, as I called them, were available to mental health workers. Uh, and we had an interesting uh, discussion with Derek Summerfield yesterday when Derek mentioned when he was the principal psychiatrist at the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture in London, he used to consciously emphasize PTSD at every point in order to facilitate asylum seekers' claim for asylum in the UK. And this is not a lie. This wasn't making something up. But it was a recognition of the, the, the avenues of legitimacy that were available and the role of mental health within the context of this, these avenues. 
So within certain contexts, as I was talking about Fasan in declining rates of political asylum, the role of mental health is particularly salient in terms of achieving a humanitarian status that will enable people to, to remain in countries. And this political dimension of global mental health needs to be engaged with. I'd like to also mention, and crucially, and this will be probably my penultimate point, the role of agency and aspiration. And this is particularly important, I think, in, in the refugee context. When I've been in Malta or in uh, Belgium or, or talked to asylum seekers in London or in Calais in, in France, I'm conscious that besides uh, compelling reasons for leaving their countries of origin, they also had, have had or continue to have dreams of the future. And these dreams and aspirations are, are what has driven them to take huge risks to cross the globe and make journeys from Malta to Northern Europe and then go through uh, uh, challenging circumstances uh, often to get from France or Belgium to the UK. But these dreams and aspirations within the refugee context are something that is studiously ignored because the system uh, requires that refugees show themselves to be completely forced migrants. In migration theory, one talks about push factors and pull factors. A legitimate refugee has to only show push factors that compelled him or her to leave their country of origin. Pull factors, aspects that attract a refugee towards a particular destination, are something not to be talked about because that suggests agency. And for example, in Europe, there is a convention called the du Dublin Convention. And the rationale behind it is that anyone who is a genuine refugee will, of course, only want to go to the country where they feel safe. Their, their concern is with safety. So, uh, so someone who goes to Malta and then tries to get to the UK must be viewed with suspicion. So therefore, the Dublin Convention requires people to claim asylum within the country they first enter. And failure to do so um, w will be greeted with considerable suspicion. So the idea of there being pool factors along with push factors is something that is denied. But from a mental health perspective, engagement with aspirations and dreams is, of course, an important part of therapeutic work. And uh, so one has a situation where being a victim is a, a, a vital modus operandi in terms of moving one's way through the asylum process, but it doesn't really engage with core mental health issues. Along with uh, this point, I'd like to mention the importance of strategies of resistance and the role of mental health and mental health professionals in this context. Uh, some years ago, I was in Australia, for example, invited by Derek Silov and his mental health team at New South Wales. And at the time, there was an enormous uh, concern about detention and the impact of detention on mental health in Woomera Refugee Centre in, in particular. And Derek and his colleagues were instrumental in stopping children being detained there. And the argument was because of mental health. And mental health problems were a consequence of being there. So that was an example, I'd say, of strategic categorization, where an awareness of the political system uh, leads to a strategic and intelligent positioning in relation to uh, mental health problems. But from a therapeutic perspective, I think this is, is a very short-term measure. And I think it's terribly important that global mental health 
engages with dreams and aspirations of refugees, and we look towards uh, trying to change the paradigm offered within the political system that denies people basic human agency. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.